Hi everyone, Yael here. And today I wanted to talk a little bit about compassion fatigue and how we might uh, do very, very simple practices to redirect compassion inward. So compassion fatigue was first coined um, with nurses who worked on oncology, on cancer wards. And they saw two things that were prevalent in these nurses. One was a feeling of being just emotionally exhausted and drained. And two is actually muscular contraction, uh, everything from their jaws to their hips and their thighs. Um, just a, a feeling of um, tightness and pain. Um, and it's since been used not just for clinical practitioners, but also for caregivers, for family members. Uh, sometimes it's called secondary or vicarious traumatization because of course, when we're caring for someone um, who is uh, really, really um, sick, there are aspects of that that can be very traumatic for those of us. And there can be a, um, a numbing out which happens if we're not careful. So, and when we think about both compassion fatigue and burnout, some of the typical responses are in fact that numbing out or what's called depersonalization, this feeling that you're kind of not in your body, but you're floating somewhere around it, like um, nothing really seems real because you become numbed by what you've had to see and maybe live through. The other one is uh, emotional exhaustion, emotional draining. And then the, the third is maybe the most dangerous, which is decreased sense of uh, personal accomplish or meaning in what you're doing. So um, you might have started off caregiving because you love the person that you're caring for and it gives you great meaning to be able to be present with them, but somewhere along the line, uh, that that meaning has been divorced from your everyday reality. And I say that that could be the most pernicious because if we can't value what it is we're doing, then it's very easy to just start um, doing things by rote, doing things without heart. And then that can lead to more numbing and more of a sense of depersonalization but also a lack of recognition that we've been pushing ourselves. And the more we push ourselves or sort of uh, work through fumes, right, is the expression, then the worse our exhaustion can get. So there's a vicious cycle with this compassion fatigue and burnout. Even Mother Teresa recognized the danger of compassion fatigue when uh, she left in her will, her desire that every four to five years, uh, the sisters in her order be given a year off to just be and not to constantly push themselves. And it's a shame that, you know, most of us aren't in the position where we can do that, but there is hope. Uh, one of my um, one of my teachers, a doctor by the name of Gabor Mate, actually what he says is that compassion fatigue doesn't exist. He says, oh, I'm gonna quote you. I'm gonna quote this. If you are fatigued, it's not because of compassion. Compassion is part of our nature. I'm not being spiritual when I say that. I'm just being scientific. Nobody gets tired from being compassionate. What you get tired of is when the flow of compassion is only in one direction. In other words, there's a valve that lets the compassion out, but it keeps it from coming back into you. So we get compassion fatigue when we have compassion for others, but not for ourselves. It's not compassion that makes you tired. It's the lack of compassion towards yourself that makes you tired. So, and I, I really see the connection between compassion and resilience because resilience is the capacity to um, respond to distressing events in our lives. 
uh, in a way, and, and to be able to be positive and flexible, effective. And obviously, if we're in a fatigued state, physically, psychologically, spiritually, then it's we're going to be more contracted and, and closed down. So many studies show that directing compassion in can help us cultivate states like gratitude, uh, can help us cultivate state like uh, hope and optimism. And so it's really self-compassion that helps us become more resilient. So we don't just practice self-compassion uh, to be kind to ourselves, although actually why not? That would be the number one reason to do it. But we also do it to be more effective um, as caregivers. So there's a few things we could do the minute that we notice that we're um, having any kinds of difficult emotion. It could be boredom, contempt, resentment, remorse, shame, uh, and anything like that. We can just really gently place one hand on our heart, or if you prefer, you could just take two hands on your heart. And just, just, just doing this will start to release oxytocin, which sometimes is called the bonding hormone or the love hormone. And so that will at least stop some of the um, draining of compassion unilaterally, and we'll start to bring some of that compassion back in. And it can just be a really simple sense of we're holding ourselves. If you want, you can also add something to this, um, which might seem counterintuitive, but again, neuroscience uh, shows that this works, which is naming, tracking. So really being very clear about what's happening for you. You know, this really hurts. Um, this is incredibly painful. Um, this is scary. This is hard. Just being able, Buddhists call this um, labeling and tracking emotions, and just being able to name, for example, I'm really angry right now, or I'm so frustrated, I don't know what to do. Just naming that will actually calm it down. It's, it's not dissimilar to those of us who have children in our lives and who try to uh, tell them, you know, use your words. <laughs> so don't just act out of the strong emotion, but actually uh, say, I'm really sad right now, or I'm really scared. That will actually also help. And then the, the final thing is to repeat little phrases to yourself. Bringing in the opposite is what the Yoga Sutras will say. And it could, you could do it in a really uh, more formal way. In Buddhism, for example, there are phrases like, may I be kind to myself right now. May I show myself great compassion. May I be at peace. May I feel a sense of ease. And you might just repeat those. May I be kind to myself right now. May I be kind to myself right now. May, until you kind of inhabit that vibration of kindness, of compassion. Another way <clears throat> that you could do it, because may I be, for some of us is a little bit formal, right? Um, so Thich Nhat Hanh, who is a Vietnamese uh, Zen Buddhist uh, monk, he was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by Martin Luther King Jr. His suggestion is to offer a, a phrase instead. These phrases, by the way, can be, can be thought of as mantras, uh, just phrases that we repeat over and over, kind of like an affirmation. And Thich Nhat Hanh says, you know, just uh, for example, you can see yourself. So there's a part of you that 
is really angry, is really scared. And see if you can actually visualize yourself in that state. And I'm gonna put my hands over my heart because that feels extra nice. And I'm sort of double dipping these self-compassion practices when I do that. I'm closing my eyes because that's helpful for me, but you don't have to. And I might talk to that part of myself that's uh, clearly out of sorts, that's feeling fatigued, that's feeling burnt out. And I might just say something like, darling, I see that you're suffering and I'm here for you. I see how difficult this is for you and I'm here for you. And you could just repeat that to yourself over and over and over again. Try doing it even just for 30 seconds to a minute and see if that doesn't help. Thank you so much for being with me.